Well, before we start our talk this morning, there's a little confusion in the program, which I'd like to call to your attention. Um, on May 17th, which is a week from today, uh, John Irwin is listed to speak, but uh, it's not possible for him to keep that appointment, so I'm taking that Sunday. I'll be here with you again next Sunday, and I will give the talk that was intended for June 21st the Chinese astrology, the year of the rooster. So that will be the subject for next Sunday, and uh, John Irwin will be speaking on the date that I've given up in June. That makes it all very clear, I'm sure. <laughs> in other words, we hope to see you next week. Uh, the subject of the morning is really a very difficult one to approach uh, in a factual manner. We all realize, I think, that there are a great many things that are true, but which can get people into trouble. We are not doubting or questioning the existence of psychic phenomena. We are not doubting the existence of nuclear research, but we don't like some of the things that happen as a result of it. We are not opposed to television but we think some of the programs are pretty terrible. We think people should write good books, but we do not like all the books that they seem to write. So that while there are truths and facts and realities, which probably in a dignified, scientific, and thoughtful manner could be very constructive, but once they hit the media, once they are popularized and dramatized, they have a tendency to cause trouble. And this is especially true, I think, in the field of psychic phenomena. For many years, this was quite a problem back in the 20s and early 30s. Then it faded away and was very seldom heard from until the last four or five years when, I suppose, I have more requests to try to untangle people involved in psychic phenomena, more for such requests than all other types of requests that come to me. People are getting into trouble every day. They do not what, know what to do or how to do it. They are confused, bewildered, and many of them are sick. And this is largely due to a simple fact that Carl Jung pointed out a number of years ago, that the average human being cannot live in a healthy manner in the midst of a mystery. We cannot handle mystery. The moment the common, ordinary facts of life become confused, when we are confronted with situations that we cannot examine, and cannot evaluate in terms of personal experience, we are in danger of a bad mental state of confusion. Psychic phenomena today is coming to us through an extensive literature, much of which is avowedly fictional. Some case histories are included. It is being presented and dramatized as a means of creating horror pictures, mystery pictures, and almost anything that will excite a jaded viewer. These types of presentations are not just entertainment. The individual is not able to distinguish clearly between what he sees and the facts of his own daily life. And uh, in addition to this, we have a large group of dabblers in the subject, individuals who have very little solid foundation upon which to build. They lack the discrimination, they lack the information, and they simply lack a perspective on the subject of metaphysical phenomena. This being true, they are in trouble. 
And one of the most difficult problems to work with in this type of trouble is psychic phenomena. If the individual is exposed to some phenomenal incident or circumstance which is outside of the experience of his common living, he has a strong tendency to be demoralized. He becomes what might be termed an easy believer. His believing will go to almost any length if it is supported by a miracle. Now, miracles are not too common, but various degrees of psychic phenomena are relatively common. They occur almost every day. They are written up in various publications, and at this time some definitely distinguished scholars are working in this area. And one very strong point that has always been present in this area and one that has basically probably been very beneficial. And that is that it was the beginning of the realization of survival of consciousness after death. Many persons who could not believe it under normal conditions accepted it when it was backed by psychic phenomena. If this phenomena is genuine, it helps to break down the materialistic barrier to the concept of life after death. Thomas Edison was converted to this concept and at the time of his death was working to try to create a scientific device by means of which it would be possible to communicate with the dead. Two world wars influenced this situation considerably. Sir Oliver Larch, Arthur Conan Doyle, many others after World War I wrote on the subject of psychic phenomena, not only as parents and as concerned human beings, but to some measure as well-trained scientists. So the field has always been of great interest. Psychic phenomena is one of the oldest forms of religious belief. Spiritism, as it was originally called, is traceable in the background of practically every human culture. It goes back to the dawn of history and beyond. It has contributed to almost every form of cultural development. It has also rather consistently uh, been on the ragged edge of being dangerous. Pythagoras admitted it but warned against the development of it. This was true of a good many other scholars. We know that it has given uh, a severe reprimand in the Old Testament, and it is considered uh, in most cultures as a dangerous, mysterious thing. Now, why do we consider it dangerous, and why is it so mysterious? I think we have to divide psychic phenomena into two general classifications, genuine and fraudulent. Genuine psychic phenomena certainly exists, but nearly every form of psychic manifestation has been duplicated fraudulently. And uh, for many years there were companies in this country that manufactured pseudo-psychic phenomena. They created instruments for slate writing. They were able to make a very substantial fabrication of trumpet speaking. Levitation. All these things have been fraudulently produced. This has resulted in the realization that if people would believe or could believe the fraudulent phenomena, then those who are able to put on such an exhibition had new and greater influence in the lives of innocent individuals who believed they were in the presence of a genuine psychic uh, mystery. So the uh, field is burdened with this. It is also burdened by a common fact of human nature, namely that even the most gifted psychic or medium 
cannot produce phenomena on demand. Uh, the individual cannot guarantee the appearance of genuine phenomena just simply because someone comes in and asks for it or a group of people gather to see it. Therefore, nearly all phenomena has had to be, to a measure, supported by psychological or other forms of uh, instruction. The individual has had to supplement phenomena with other means of influencing the minds of persons he wished to influence. This gradually got more or less out of hand and has been for a long time uh, a very serious uh, handicap to the development of the genuine faculties of man's extrasensory perception range. Now, some types of psychic phenomena are more commonly uh, fabricated than others. Some types are so personal, so intimate, so tied to the individual himself that there are no elements of probability that they could be fabricated. One of these, for instance, is psychometry, in which the individual himself has the experience of finding certain memories, thoughts, or reconstructions of previous incidents as a result of his own nature. Wherever psychic phenomena comes from within the individual himself and is more or less guaranteed by the fact that no medium or professional person interposes between the uh, psychic and his phenomena, we have fairly substantial grounds for the belief that it is genuine. We also realize that we are coming closer and closer to the development of our own extrasensory perception gamut. More and more we are having experiences of the development of faculties that have been latent. Among the various systems of the development of such faculties are some that deal very closely with psychic phenomena. The, the religious and philosophic aspects of this search for inner guidance will be found principally in Oriental religious systems or Christian mysticism. The mystical experience is not inclined to create too much problem or does not contribute to most of the difficulties with which we are confronted. Now, the next important point I think we have to make is to analyze and study the individual who becomes involved in psychic phenomena. The average person who is involved is a lonely, more or less introverted individual who has some earnest desire either to communicate with the dead because of bereavement or to gain some type of experience of life after death as a support to a religious conviction. This type of person is for the most part an easy believer. They are looking and desiring so desperately and definitely that they do not generally use a great deal of critical thoughtfulness in the matter. They want to believe in psychic phenomena. They want it because they need it to fill an emptiness in themselves. They feel deserted, lonely, isolated, or frustrated, and hope that in some way the psychic situation will assist to remedy this condition. Because of the fact there is very little basic experience, very little critical knowledge, these persons can be very easily deceived. Also, there is a whole group of psychic phenomena in which there is no intentional to deceive at all, where a mystical experience, a dream, a nightmare, or some subconscious uh, reflex within the person has caused them to assume that they are in the presence of a spiritual reality. 
Many persons have built philosophies, systems, creeds, and cults upon a dream. A dream which, were they not believers, would have meant nothing to them. But because they were not only believers but constantly hopeful, things they had read, the things that had been told to them, longings and yearnings of their own, affected the sleep state resulting in what appeared to be a psychic experience. Now, a psychic experience of this kind is clearly not to be considered archetypal. An archetypal dream is not the kind that generally produces this form of phenomena. An archetypal dream is something from within the individual that is demanding recognition. It is an instructional factor. It is the internal teacher being heard from. But a great deal of this psychic phenomena arises from hallucination. It arises from the individual whose desperate desire to believe permits him to believe that which is not reasonable, not probable, and not consistent with his own good. This we've find so very, very common. Another difficulty with the matter is that once the believer has gotten into a psychic difficulty, it is extremely difficult to rescue him. The psychic experience which he believes to have occurred is stronger than any counseling that can be given to him. Once he has decided that he is in the presence of a spiritual experience, there is very, very little chance that you can talk him out of it, even when it becomes obvious to a third person that the experience is not genuine. We have all the time this type of problem coming in, people wanting help in these various fields. But it is practically useless to try unless the individual involved is willing to try his own experience for himself, unless he is willing to sit down and answer some basic questions and answer them honestly. There is very little that anyone on the outside can do that will overcome the desire, the devout intention to believe this particular type of thing. So you can always say to yourself, if you're involved in psychic phenomena, you can ask yourself a few uh, vital questions. One of the most common types of psychic experience is the one that calls the individual to a ministry. It is one in which something, usually the subconscious, seeking release, seeking the experience of self-superiority, likes to hope or feel or believe that they are called to change the course of history, that they have a message that has been given to them that the world is waiting for. Now the uh, question that you ask these people frequently is why, if you feel this way, do you believe that you are peculiarly qualified to receive this message? What makes you, th what made you the candidate for this overwhelming revelation? How did it happen that they picked on you? And now, normally, the individual has no very good answer to that question. The most common answer is, I haven't the slightest idea. So you start to try to find out, and you say to yourself, if you uh, were hiring someone to carry on a special and delicate and difficult task, how would you choose to, to engage that particular person? Well, you'd ask questions, you'd get a resume, you'd find out what they'd done, you'd try to locate something in them by which they were peculiarly fitted to do the thing that you need it done. Well, we may assume that some powers on the other side of life, selecting a candidate for a delicate job, 
would also explore into the capacities of that person. They would uh, choose someone to, who could do the work, who had a background for it, who was well integrated personally, and could carry this responsibility with dignity, whose integrity was so great they would not exploit or commercialize it, and would not be led astray by various temptations involved in this type of labor. But you ask the person these questions, and you seldom, if ever, get a decent answer. The thing is, they just don't know. They believe that they have been chosen, but they do not know why. And when an individual has this particular problem, a very interesting thing uh, comes along. I've had many people come to me and say, I have been selected for a very important work. Well, so what is it? I don't know. I have had a message. I can't read it. Perhaps you can tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, it's difficult to imagine that a person would receive some kind of a serious job and not know why or how or what to do after they had it. And gradually it becomes more or less evident that the situation is bound to wishful thinking, a desperate desire to find some outlet, some way of attaining a kind of distinction in society. There are many types of this problem that come along as gay as the days pass. And one of the other important factors we all have to bear in mind is that the person interested in this type of phenomena, usually it was some time along the way, comes under the influence of group activities. Somewhere along the line there is someone who is specializing or believes they are in this type of research and uh, there is a constant tendency of people on this of this type to want to get further development to get further strengthening of their extrasensory perceptions through some type of personal discipline or instruction this gets to be very complicated however unfortunately because in many instances the blind lead the blind and everything goes bad. In other instances we find the individual presented with a type of mystery in the group with which he associates himself, which is not very healthy. Not long ago we received a letter requesting information. This person wanted to join a group that they felt might have the kind of answer that they were seeking. But in order to join this group, they had to take an obligation, they had to take a vow that they would give complete unquestioning obedience to the leaders of that group. Whatever the leader asked them to do, that they would do without question or hesitation. Well, I would be very much inclined to depart from that group or never get into it. In the next place, in the same point of view, the information was not available as to who was the head of the group. So you were taking a blind obligation of total obedience to persons you have never known, never heard of, and have no way of estimating. When you get a situation of this kind, I think the wise person is best invited to refrain from accepting such an obligation system. The individual's only primary obligation is to God, and next to that, his own integrity. He is, has certain social obligations to his nation, to his family, to his society, and to compromise these with some kind of an obligation which we are not enabled or not able to understand requesting that we take upon ourselves the complete servitude uh, to an unknown person 
is not in line with true esoteric good taste or or safety. It is a very dangerous thing. Also, we find very often the, the rising tide of commercialism coming into this problem. The uh, formation of groups, the writing of books, the production of television or theatrical plays uh, for business reasons, for profit, and uh, as far as that's concerned, simply to cater to a market is not a good way for the mysteries of life to be promulgated. It is much too dangerous. I have read a number of the recent books dealing with these subjects. One or two have been very well written and carefully written. For the most part, the others are simply paperback fantasy. They are written only for one purpose, and that is to sell and make money. And these are taken seriously by persons who are already sold to the idea that such procedures are possible. If a person is interested in becoming a member of some mystically oriented organization, it is up to them for their own security and safety to make a thorough investigation of the background and foreground of such a group. It is very unwise to join something which the beginnings of which are unknown, the purposes of which are indefinite, and the future of which is uncertain. Therefore, for all general purposes, we give the same general recommendation that we give in connection with reading or study or anything of that nature. It is important that the things you believe have stood the test of time. It is essential that you associate with an organization or group which has stood for principles and the history and development of which is available to the public as common knowledge. They're an organization that has had a long and distinguished history and has not been in trouble and has com never commercialized unreasonably any part of its tradition gives you a certain sense of confidence. And more still, if it is rooted and founded in one of the great world systems of spiritual revelation, it is very much more likely to be legitimate. If, therefore, its background is reasonable, it makes no pretensions or claims, it promises nothing except the opportunity to study, to grow, and to develop normally. This type of organization can be approached with greater safety and greater sense of security and probability. But wherever we get into the weird and the wonderful, uh, we are apt to be in trouble. It's just not the best way to do this type of thing. Another point that I think is very important is authority. When a special revelation comes along, who is responsible for it? Nearly always, you have one of two choices. Either that the system has been developed by an individual who takes full responsibility for it and who has probably based it upon older source material which he is willing to discuss, describe, and state. It is also probable that he can prove reasonably to the average person that his ideas have common sense, practical value, and do not stimulate unreasonable emotions or attitudes. This type of person uh, is comparatively safe, as Confucius pointed out, and many of the older ones. Confucius said, well, you have an idea, don't quote yourself. He said, it is much better for you to find an appropriate quotation among the sages, those who have been wise and learned and helpful to mankind. If you wish to make a statement, always back it up by some legitimate person who has 
proven in daily life that they knew more than the average and that this knowledge has endured and been supported and substantiated by centuries of application, then you are reasonably safe. But be extremely cautious with books that are written by unknown beings, persons from other planets, or persons that have uh, no relationship to common life. Be very, be very cautious of accepting an authority that you cannot check. And if the time comes and you want to know where the message comes from, and you are given some very fantastic explanation that you can never verify, then it seems that you should approach with caution. Out of the same sequence as this comes the problem of what happens when we begin to try to accept these different things. Supposing good-naturedly, consecratedly, and with faith and uh, solid belief, we follow one of these systems. We go in and we listen to the way they tell us it should be done. They have a, a development program. They have ways of uh, helping you to become wiser. They also may toss in a few promises of advanced finances and real estate. So, believing in them and taking the disciplines, doctrines, exercises, meditations, and so forth, which they recommend, what happens? Are you able to retain your common sense well enough to watch the results of these things upon your own personal life? Do you find at the end of six months or a year that you are really a better person? That you have grown? That your family life is closer? That you understand your children better? That you are a better citizen? That you are inspired to genuine self-improvement through self-discipline and the control of negative habits and attitudes? Are you growing? Or are you simply being filled with a mass of abstract thought which you cannot apply to anything or have never thought of trying to apply. Are you growing or are you simply remembering a group of material factors which may or may not ever prove to be true? If at the end of a few months of this special discipline you're beginning to feel miserable, your appetite gets bad, your sleep is disturbed, you are seeing things that are not there and you are more or less involved in strange feelings, experiences, that you have very strange dreams, that you uh, develop uh, certain factors or attitudes which appear to be semi-clairvoyant, but have very little utility in them. It's like the individual who was able to study the other planes of nature by extrasensory perception but was unable to find a lost cufflink in his own bureau drawer. He worked on it hard, but it was much easier to see things that weren't there than find something that was lost here. So we have to think about this. Most of the people who come in trouble are troubled by the consequences of the methods that they have been given for self-development purposes. One of the most common of these causes, of course, is that they have been given the impression that these exercises or this membership or this allotment is going to make it unnecessary for them to become basically better people. It is going to be done with a formula. It is going to be done that by a method that can be given to the good, the bad, and the indifferent, and it will work for all of them because it's the formula that is important. And this formula is the direct route to enlightenment. The uh, answer to this is nearly always the same. Misery. Disillusion. So the individual finally comes to the fact that he has supported his own uh, gullibility with a mass of psychic phenomena. 
He has, for instance, spent years studying the constructions of some psychic situation which he will never see, never know, and never realize whether he's right or wrong. But he memorizes it all. He memorizes a, a series of wonders. He follows a series of beliefs that he cannot justify except by blind acceptance. He also develops gradually within himself an alter ego, within his own nature. There gradually arises within him a kind of psychic delusion that all these things are important. The uh, things that are told to him on the outside come back out of him from the inside and begin to support what is actually nothing but a conceit of his own. This being the problem, we, we face these difficulties in numerous persons who should know better, but who frankly do not wish to be disillusioned. You tell one of these persons that what he is doing is simply self-destructive, and, and that person will walk out and go on looking until he finds somebody who will agree with him. The uh, person caught in the web of phenomena is usually in a difficult and dangerous position. Now, there are systems by which nearly everything that is important can be gradually known by thoughtful persons. Almost everything that is taught by secret orders that is legitimate can be learned without membership because these, these thoughts, these ideals, these principles are available in the basic texts of the original revelations. If you want to understand Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen, if you want to study the Kabbalah, if you want to know more about the Greek mysteries, if you wish to understand the astrology of the Chaldeans or Babylonians, you do not have to join anything to do it. The only thing you have to do is find a competent basic text by one of the original originators of the idea. And you know the great names that are associated with nearly every branch of knowledge. And uh, these great names, as founders, have survived with dignity the test of ages. And you are not likely to get into trouble. You may not agree with them. You don't have to follow them. But if you want to follow a certain line of thought, it is best to follow those who have been best at it and have done the most to develop this particular field of action. Now, it's a very difficult thing in many instances to determine the difference between psychic phenomena and psychological phenomena. This is something that has confounded the ages. And even today, experts have not entirely smoothed out this mystery or this strange parallelism of phenomena. A psychic phenomena can be largely reproduced psychologically. It is, however, not likely that such a psychological procedure will have physical equivalents. But this is not necessarily true. It is quite possible for the psychic energies of the individual, when strongly developed and specialized, can result in physical phenomena. Examples of this, of course, are the table levitations and things of this nature, in which a physical factor is present the average medium assumes that this physical factor represents another being, an entity from the other side of the veil, that, the, that it's another being that produces the phenomena. Actually, there is no reason to question that it can be produced by the individual who is there at the time, by the use and specialization of the psychic energies within himself. It is perfectly possible for a pressure of energy from the invisible part of the person can be precipitated to produce at least a minor physical symptomology or symbolism. 
So psychological phenomena can include some physical manifestations that have generally been regarded as conclusive of the presence of another being. The psychological phases of phenomena are mostly uh, in the form of internal experiences of one kind or another. They include possessional and obsessional circumstances. Most cases of psychic possession or obsession are psychological. They are not due to the actual presence of another being, but they are due to conditions within the individual himself which have produced a kind of psychic demonology in his own nature. He is presented not with another entity, but with the negative entity of his own personality. The, the demon in him is the source of his obsession in most instances. Also, we find that dreams, revelations of all kinds, prophetic utterances, oracular demonstrations, all of these things can be psychological. The worst phase of the psychological situation is autohypnosis. The person who has closed their mind to common sense, who has refused constantly to accept realities, but who wishes to live in a world of self-delusion, can gradually defend this position until he is practically impregnable. Yeah. Nothing can do any further good to that person unless perhaps a very terrible emergency arises. Under this form of self-delusion, you can have all kinds of optical phenomena. further good to that person unless perhaps a very terrible emergency arises. Under this form of self-delusion, you can have all kinds of optical phenomena, as in the case of hypnosis. Under hypnosis, a person can definitely see things that are not there and can also be deprived of seeing things that are there. Under auto-hypnosis, Fantasy may be mingled with reality into a hopeless confusion, so that it is quite conceivable that almost anything you wish to believe, whether it's the presence of superior beings, angels, or deities, can be reproduced psychologically by the intensity of your own belief. It can actually become visual because of the intensity of psychological believing. Unfortunately, of course, anything that originates within yourself, no matter how glamorous it may be in the form of phenomena, cannot go beyond whatever you are. You receive a message saying that in the due course of time, a secret unknown to anyone else is going to be given to you. Well, the, the secret is never given. Why? Because it would require something to come out of you that isn't there. The secret cannot be communicated because you do not know it in the first place. Therefore, some entity or being that you have fabricated cannot give it to you. I know a number of uh, pr practical cases of this in which a person under a belief fixation have been given entire life waiting for the revelation of that great and secret message. It never came. Because the person himself could not fabricate more than his own consciousness possessed. This means of the futility of most forms of revelation. The only way in which a genuine revelation can come is through a deep and abiding integrity and through a full or at least reasonable understanding of the processes of human growth. 
Almost all great religions have had their mystical beliefs and their mystical sects. And these are always developed along one line, one pattern, which involves humility, dedication, integrity, and discipline. These are the priceless ingredients. The discipline is not primarily to be given to you by someone else, unless, in a, as in the case of a small child, discipline is necessary because the person is not yet able to discipline themselves. But if this discipline is given, it is supported by a solid foundation of known facts. The reasons for it are clearly given. The authority for it is clearly revealed. And the indi individual is, in the, is not in the presence of anything mysterious and uh, strange or unreasonable. But disciplines and uh, the gentle art of growing are the keys to spiritual integrity. A life of service is far more important than a life dedicated to self-development per se. Uh, the individual who is studying in order to be better themselves very often gets into trouble. The reason why we should study is because we want to be more useful to the common good. We wish to live better lives. It is not that we wish to be uh, superior to others, but that we wish to be suitable to the needs of others in their various walks of life and their various degrees of personal unfoldment. The problems of, re of communities involved in this type of activity. It's, this type of problem is very, very uh, much in evidence. A community of spiritually oriented people is in the same dilemma that the world is in today for the reason that every nation believes it is right and cannot get along with anyone else. Most of these groups of persons either have to be dominated by an individual whose knowledge may not be adequate, or else the gradually com competition comes in. The individual is no longer satisfied. He must either finally agree with the others or depart. And if the others were doing a job good enough to agree with, it might be different, but this is not always the case. So for the most part, the person grows best by staying in the world, meeting the problems of the day with integrity, and recognizing that the problems and responsibilities of life are the great initiators into the mystery of the Holy Spirit, that there is no other way in which it can be done successfully. So we have tried to work out, in one way or another, suggestions and recommendations for persons who are out of their depth in what might be termed spiritual growth. It's not because they're growing too fast or have grown too uh, rapidly. It's the fact that they are confused where they are. And instead of finding the things they are doing are bringing them this enlightenment, they come out at the end of five, ten, twenty years of dedicated devotion, uh, no wiser than they were before. If their dedication was sincere, they may do well and grow even if the instruction is wrong. Because it is not the instruction, it is the dedication and the integrity that constitute the source of growth. You may follow a doctrine that cannot be proven, and you can grow from it simply because you make changes in yourself that take care of the, of the problem. You become more dedicated, more devout, more sincere. And through unselfish dedication to an idea, even though the idea may not be completely correct, there is a definite growth to the person. This is why all sects of religion, regardless of whether we approve of them or not, are equally important in bringing to each individual the opportunity to make a personal dedication to something greater than himself. 
This is the important thing. But uh, it is one thing to be dedicated uh, to a great pattern of things, and quite another to be dedicated uh, to something that is ephemeral, has no uh, central substance, and is backed only uh, by a weight of words rather than a weight of deeds. So we try to work out some kind of a, a solution to these particular problems. If, in the course of trying to grow sincerely and lovingly and as wisely as you know, you're in trouble, particularly in trouble involving the nervous system, in uh, dreams, uh, spiritual visitations, uh, various obsessional factors, or uh, visitations, or if you believe you are being haunted, or if your health is failing, or your family can no longer get along with you, the point is stop right then and there. Stop any system which makes it impossible for you to be a normal person. Because growth is not by way of abnormalcy. Growth is an expansion of normalcy to higher levels of usefulness and integrity. The moment your disciplines are giving you a headache or a backache or interfering with blood pressure or causing you to see things that are disagreeable or disturb your sleep, result in the feeling or awareness of presences that are not there, the moment this type of thing begins, stop the discipline right in its tracks. Go no further. And if you are the member of a group, then the thing for you to go to do is go directly to the leader of that group and tell them what the trouble is and what they say you should do about it. In most cases, people who have come to me have tried this, and the group leader has not been able to help them. Because actually, the leader is not really much better informed than his followers. He doesn't know what to do when development exercises cause trouble. Development exercises, in general, are an effort to make spiritual growth a scientific process. In certain areas, as in the higher phases of Raja Yoga and things of this nature, advanced uh, stages of Zen, there are many very important scientific factors involved. But nobody gets to that point until he is well qualified to accept these revelations without self-delusion. It takes anywhere from five to twenty years of patient self-improvement to prepare the individual for some very advanced type of instruction. The, the whole system has to be built up. Every part of life has to be brought into coordination. For whatever the weaknesses are, they are the things that will get you into trouble. A most common weakness is gullibility. And against that, there is no defense except common sense. So if you are being uh, instructed, try to find out how this instruction is being given and what the instruction is. And if it does not work, stop it. If any unpleasant symptoms arise, stop it. If on the, also, if you find that you are not well integrated in the activity you are carrying on, supposing you feel and discover from experience that the group activity with which you are associated is not good for you, the answer to that is move out of the group. Now, there's a catch in this, however, for a great many groups have the attitude that if you leave them, they will punish you. You are warned that if you do not stay with the organization, that the organization will do various psychic things to hurt you. The moment this comes into the picture, anyone with common sense 
knows the quicker they get out, the better. But to a great many persons who have become believers in the power of mind over matter, who are convinced that this teacher could produce an adverse or malicious force in their lives, these people settle down to frightening themselves to death. It doesn't, it doesn't follow that the leader of the group has to do anything. The individual who believes he can and believes he would will take care of the situation themselves. They'll have all the experiences, all the persecutions, all the psychic maliciousness you can imagine simply because they believe firmly that the person whom they suspect is well able to perform such activity. Actually, the person who decides that it's time to go and not be part of it any longer must follow that basic instinct and go and realize in himself that in so doing he is defending truth and defending his own consciousness against errors which he previously accepted. Normally speaking, the uh, problem of this malicious influence from someone else fades out very quickly if the person develops other interests. But if they are frightened to death, go and live alone in a room or an apartment, settle back and worry over every night that this is going to happen, then you have the type of person who is fit for exorcism. A person who is frightened to death by the fears of his own inner imagination. This common situation uh, is unfortunately quite prevalent. Now, another type of psychic phenomena that uh, very often seems to show up at the present time is this problem of automatic writing or things of that nature, something uh, like the Ouija board. Uh, the planchette, as it was called in Europe, was forbidden in France because of the number of deaths, crimes, miseries that were caused by this little table which was referred to in Europe as the Devil's Flat Iron. The Ouija board is about the poorest source of information in the world. And yet people who would never believe a factual statement surrender instantly if they believe that their granduncle is on the Ouija board with them. This makes it a wonderful, mysterious, overwhelming thing. Ella Wheeler Wilcox went through the session of the Ouija board and came out very strongly against it. But many persons who have been bereaved feel that this is a way of communicating with the dead. Another way of communicating is your automatic writing. And your automatic writing is almost always psychological rather than psychic. It is a method of negatively getting out of your system things that are there. The fact that you do not consciously move your hand doesn't mean that a ghost is doing it. It simply means that your own subconscious has taken control of it. And out of it will come whatever your subconscious has in it. Now, it may be that in some cases the subconscious might have a little genuine information for you, but more likely... It is simply a problem of releasing frustrations, neurotic pressures, personal unhappiness, and seeking some kind of an escape from boredom or the sense of personal inferiority. So the thing to do is, if possible, uh, to get away from all these things. We are not supposed to strengthen our present life by contact with those who have gone before who, while they were alive, may not have been any better off than we are. The death does not transform a person into a prophet, a seer, or a saint, or a sage. The only thing that accomplishes this is the experience of life in this world in the daily meeting of responsibilities and problems. So all this type of thing is fascinating. 
and it is something that catches the mind in a web. Now against this, of course, has been the very strong and positive influence of materialism. Materialism simply discounts the entire field. Your materialist does not have these kind of experiences. It's very rare. If an utter materialist has such an experience, it really is worth giving a careful look at that particular happening. But for the most part, uh, the materialist is not bothered by any of these things. He doesn't suffer from ghosts. He doesn't live in haunted houses. He doesn't have any worry over automatic writing. He doesn't have a Ouija board and doesn't want it. And it never occurs to him that his deceased relatives want to communicate with him because he does not believe in the survival of life after death. Therefore, his deceased relatives have no existence as far as he is concerned. As a result is very little psychic involvement. Now, however, we're having a, a change in the mood. A great many persons who were materialists up to a short time ago are beginning to contemplate such problems as the extrasensory perception and reincarnation and karma and even uh, other forms of esoteric uh, Eastern or Western mysticism. We are beginning to develop what might be termed a, a level of mysticism among more informed and cultured people. It is no longer a folk belief. It is now a belief that is beginning to influence scientific thinking. It is beginning to result in uh, a new approach to life after death and a new interpretation of the mysteries of what lies beyond the grave. Escaping from the dogmatism of literal theology, uh, the mind goes to philosophy, to ethics, to religion, and to mysticism, and gradually applies in these fields something of the scientific process which has previously been limited largely to materialism. So we have a new, new type of psychic investigator who is approaching it not as an easy believer, but not with a mind locked against it. Now in the uh, times of Oliver Lodge and uh, Conan Doyle, your uh, scientist, who became a spiritualist, really was completely out of his depth. He was therefore a divided person, a scientist in his mind and a spiritualist because of emotional pressure within himself, usually involved with the death of someone close to him. Now, however, we have a somewhat different point of view. Uh, the uh, new type of research is not based upon a desire for consolation from beyond the grave. It is now an effort to expand the dimensions of life, to discover, if possible, what is happening in the psych psychic, soul, and spirit realms of human and human existence, to find out the causal world the world from which things descend into visibility. Now, and, uh, not too long ago, anything in that invisible world, if it existed at all, was frightening. Uh, demons were invisible to the average person, but they were part of the inhabitants of this world of Dante's Inferno. We, be, we were afraid of the dark. We were afraid of that type of darkness which is called the unknown. We were afraid that outside of the range of our own physical limitations was a realm of values so immense, so incredible, and so complicated that the human mind could not cope with it. So it was best to leave the curtain down and not attempt to be faced with more than would be possible to the average person's comprehension. Now, however, the tendency is to look in that direction to see if we can release the mind from the prison of materiality, if we can escape from this dismal procedure of assuming that life simply is a transitory thing and that we are all surrounded by a collective and individual oblivion. This type of thing seems to be supported by a considerable amount of science. 
scientists begin to recognize that there are various threads that they are following all gradually lead to something which they cannot see and which as yet they have been unable to estimate. But it's certain that gradually estimation of these factors will come and uh, we will have a broadening of our background as far as spiritual realities are concerned. No one can really live a good life who does not believe in immortality does not believe in the reality of a deity, does not really believe in ethics and, and integrities. All of the great religions of the world have given us this priceless heritage of the realization that our existence is a divine purpose, that the individual and everything that lives exists for a purpose, that we cannot, under any conditions, survive as sincere, civilized beings unless we give more thought to where we came from, a little more attention to where we are, and a great deal of very sober reasoning as to where we go from here. We cannot live without perspective. Religion and philosophy give us perspective. Science gives us instruments and by means of which we can organize our various thoughts and censor them and save ourselves from a mass of hallucinational material. So uh, in psychic phenomena, more and more universities are becoming interested, professorships are being set up to study the problem, and uh, the sensitivities of individuals in telepathy and things of this nature are being studied and classified. We are on the verge of discovering a new level of human existence. When that level comes to us, however, it's going to be natural. It is not going to be something that frightens us to death. We are not going to lift the curtain and find chaos on the other side. Nor are we going to find this other side filled with evil spirits or the souls of a destructive dead. This uh, problem of what we're going to find there will gradually be solved and we will discover that the invisible cause of visibility is not evil. It is not something terrifying. It is not nothing but punishment. It is, in fact, a new land which we are going to have to explore and colonize in due time. Lands and worlds that lie beyond our present temporal boundaries. But whatever is there is not going to hurt us. It's not going to be dangerous to us. We are more in more danger here than we will ever be hereafter. We must find the solution to our present danger through the reorganization of society. And we must uh, find the solution to our inner anxieties about the invisible through the gradual organization of our own understanding and insight. We're going to have to gradually develop common sense in dealing with this uncommon subject. And if we can do this in a creditable manner, we will get along pretty much as we should. We also have to watch a little bit, I think, the involvement of a very poor philosophy of esotericism in entertainment. We are having all kinds of films now dealing with obsessions, with possessions. We are having all kinds of demoniacal factors, all kinds of psychic persecution. All this type of thing is coming to us uh, under the sponsorship of olamargarine and detergents. <laughs> It is very interesting to see demons rising on every hand on the 15 or 18 inch screen with intermissions for donuts. <laughs> but in a sense, this type of thing is becoming a, a, a hardship upon all of us. It becomes a hardship because seeing is believing. And things that are seen are very difficult to reject. Things we hear, we can get over. 
but things we see have a certain verisimilitude uh, which works a great hardship upon the easy believer. And being bombarded with this type of thing constantly and having horror picture after horror picture imposed upon us, the uh, viewer, even children, find it increasingly difficult not to be affected. And for millions of people, all these horror films are actually believed to be based upon solid fact. They are accepted as realities, which is something we should never do. Up to a few years ago, we had another group of realities. That is the dramatic production, which consisted very largely of compounds of human misery. We had nothing but disappointed, disillusioned, frustrated people. We had infidelity, we had corruption, immorality, and everything as part of society. And we gradually have not only come to believe all this to be true, but we have inspired otherwise normal persons to experiment with it themselves. We are creating delinquency to support the fact that we believe the picture is telling the truth. And we keep on until the picture does tell the truth. Now, your psychic problem is the same thing. We are creating uh, beliefs that are unsound, unfair, unreasonable. We are causing people to become more and more fearful. We are advertising and documenting of situations that have been manufactured, presumably for our entertainment. But anyone who finds these things entertaining had better make a very careful examination of his own inner life because he's on the verge of trouble already. We are not, we should not be entertained by that which is unreasonable, destructive, morbid, or uh, uh, revolting to our normal faculties. So we have to watch this because we'll have more and more of this type of thing, more and more propaganda about internal beings of mysterious creatures, and it now is beginning to take shape that uh, we are going to switch our point of emphasis from flying saucers to flying demons. We are gradually going to create realities in our own thinking, which have no foundation in fact. Persons who are interested in growth or trying to live better lives and get somewhere with their problems will be wise to censor their viewing of a great deal of this type of material and censor their reading of books of this kind. Persons interested in these subjects are in instinctively inclined to pick up a book that seems to deal with a subject close to their own hearts but they do not realize what the author is going to do with the material. And very often it ends merely in enlarging terror, fear, or anxiety, or causing the person to accept as true something that has no uh, authority whatever except in a writer's imagination. So to keep this psychic situation under control, we have to constantly guard ourselves against over-influence. Overinfluence is one of the most common problems we have. And uh, if we're not careful, the mere fact of our own sincerity may get us into trouble. We are so anxious to know more, we are so anxious to learn more, and we are so hopeful that something good will be said that we open ourselves to a great deal of psychic confusion. For a long time, we had very little black magic in our environment. But it is also beginning to become more prevalent. Sorcery and all this type of thing, um, ritual magic, all this form of activity is becoming uh, more frequent. Only a person in a position like mine knows what frequency means. We know a little bit about how these things are being spread and who is being influenced by them. And we cannot do better than to warn everyone uh, to refrain from involvement 
in any type of procedure which is inclined to create visual phenomena. We have people who are trying to develop the yoga systems who are in serious trouble because they have tried to become spiritual before they had become honestly adjusted as normal human beings. They were trying to develop extrasensory perceptions when they had not developed the sensory perceptions they were naturally endowed with. We like to jump into something superior. We like to think that we are uniquely capable of a much higher degree of insight than we now possess. But the truth is, we have just exactly the amount of insight that we are entitled to. And the only way to get more is to grow, to become better, to unfold our natural potentials. But to look for shortcuts and special disciplines is to open oneself to a tragedy. Therefore, we say that the psychic phenomena field can be, in part at least, genuine. That such things have happened and been recorded from the dawn of time. But that the cultivation of phenomena as a, as a means of spiritual growth is exceedingly dangerous and should be approached only under a long probationary period of self-discipleship or the strongest possible internal integrities. Nearly always the problem lies in vanity or in some form of self-interest. The person wants to be more powerful without being a better person. He wants to have more influence, but he has never developed the type of influence that would make, give him distinction. He wants to perhaps create an organization to be worshipped and adorned, and adored himself when he is not entitled to it. Wherever self-interest, egotism, and things of this nature enter into the quest for knowledge, trouble is right there with them. The only reason why a person who is honest wants to know more is in order to serve better the needs of others. He is not seeking for self-aggrandizement. He is seeking to do the daily job better and to help more people in more ways because he has gained certain integrities of his own. Among other things, he will have the problem of trying to keep his own children out of difficulties. The use of knowledge is to help others, not to advance one's reputation or distinction. It is not at all necessary that the uh, individual uh, should have ulterior motives. It is much better to be very simple, very honest, very kind, very sincere, and try to grow as nature intended, step by step, degree by degree, strengthening growth through good works, earning the next step by being true to the present step, and realizing that the journey to wisdom is a long trip, but that each step toward that end is important. And any step which is circuitous or takes the person off the main track is simply time wasted. There's only one way of growing, and that is by becoming better through self-discipline and dedication. On that basis, there's no difficulty. Or if there is difficulty, we have the resources to meet it. But when we begin to get uh, extravagant notions, then we are already on the way to disillusionment, disappointment, and very possibly sickness and disorientation. So uh, we advise everyone uh, to be very cautious and very thoughtful in these matters. Well, I guess that's all for today. <laughs> <laughs>